All right. So, hello, Disobey. I hope you're all doing good. Are you? Yeah. Uh, that, I thought so. So, all right. Uh, this time, this, uh, I'm going to talk about remote timing attacks and information leaks. Uh, this is so nice. We had like uh, timing at timing side channels in a couple previous presentations, so I'm not alone here. Uh, okay. So, uh, who is this guy? Uh, my name is Joona Kannisto, and I used to work at Tampere University of Technology. There's a side channel research group there, and this is more like hobby stuff compared to what they're doing. So, if you're interested, you have like uh, some crypto applications or whatever, and you want to throw your money at somebody, there's Billy Bramley there who uh, leads this uh, side channel research group. Uh, currently, I'm working, working at Qualcomm Product Security, and also uh, we're looking for talented people also in Finland. Uh, not, not in Finland, but uh, from Finland. Um, <clears throat> so we had a lot of introduction already to side channels. So here are uh, three stupid examples of that. So if your pizza guy would be like a very, very clever guy, they would know how your company is doing by just uh, uh, looking at how, how your company orders pizza. So if it's panic pizza, they would know to short you and otherwise buy your stock. And then like if you type on your keyboard, somebody listens to that, they can guess the most probable key, key pattern. And then uh, there was recently a side channel uh, where Linus Torvalds was not complaining about a patch to Linux kernel, which was really, really had really serious performance penalty. So that was a side channel about the meltdown side channel. And so how deep can we go? Um, okay. So, but my talk is going to be about timing side channels more specifically. So this is kind of the uh, standard example that you saw. So you have a for loop, uh, which is uh, comparing two inputs, input from the attacker and some secret password or whatever. And it's doing it character by character. So uh, you in increment the loop counter and, and look at the next, next one. And if those bytes differ, uh, you return from the loop. So. Uh, some, some people think that you cannot really uh, see this kind of timing difference when the uh, loop invariant is increased by one in other case, and in other cases it's not, but in some cases you can, you can see this. And for the last question, who would write unsafe code like this? Uh, many people, unknowingly at least, so if you have like some high-level uh, programming language, uh, this uh, string equals function in that one could easily end up being exactly this, uh, at least quite close to the hardware or somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So the reason uh, why I want to talk about this is that this area in general, it, even though it's like in academic research, it's uh, probably like 20 years or, or longer even, it might be 30, 35, 40 years old stuff. But uh, many developers don't know what's it, what's it all about, like how you actually uh, exploit these kind of things and how you protect from those things. And then also, uh, you don't really know how much this stuff is used in the wild. So because these are essentially usually uh, information leaks, so you actually need some other kind of attack vector to actually do something, uh, some, something dangerous. So for, for example, you don't usually gain anything by getting a server's private key. You need to launch some other attack using that private key. So nobody buys pizza for pri with private keys unless they're Bitcoin private keys. And this is, of course, if you're a penetration tester, this is nice, nice thing to have in your toolbox. So and apl for application de developers, if you know how to measure your stuff, then you kind of remove lots of uncertainty uh, about these kind of things. So um, how it usually goes, you find some uh, function, sus suspect function that is guarding some sensitive data. You have timers, and those should be pretty accurate timers. And you start those timers 
very close where you make a query, and then you stop those timers, and you save, save your timing, timer, and then you repeat this a lot of times. And from the timing data, you do some processing to try to find a timing signal. Uh, you might be looking for timing differences or, or like actually really exploitable signal depending on, on what, what's your target. And then you, if you find something, it might, might be a good idea to try to disprove that you're wrong because you can also, uh, if you're misapplying statistics, you can find no, uh, signals where there are not none. All right, um, so story time. This is like a practical example. Um, and so um, this is just to tell you that timing leaks are everywhere. So I, a while ago, a couple of years back, I, I wanted to have like delegated SSH logins. So we had a lab server, and that one, uh, I, I don't want to maintain anybody's current credentials there. So, but, but the students were able to upload their SSH keys to the main university server. So I decided to make like a simple tool uh, to ask uh, like just uh, any SSH key from the uh, other server. So uh, basically, we do the SSH, SSH key exchange, and then we send the uh, user, uh, user supplied key to the other server, and then we either receive that the user has that key on that other server or doesn't have that. And then we go on and ask about ask for signatures if the user is allowed to log in. So we kind of have a federated or delegated SSH login here with, by using public keys. Uh, but that require, required kind of building, building a specific tool. So and, and then uh, at some point, I learned about timing attacks. And then basically what you do here is that you stop caring about the actual response. You, be, you just start sending queries. And you start measuring the time that it may, takes to make the query and get, the, get an answer. So basically, in the uh, SSH case, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just uh, going to send a key with a certain username and check how long the response will take. Uh, this is like a flow chart of how this is going to play out. So the server's time use is going downwards, and then every no, 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 no here uh, basically skies the limit uh, is going to go to the not OK, and it's going to return early if, if the no condition happens. So first, first we have a leak where whether the user is valid and allowed. And then we have another leak if the user is valid and uh, we either find an authorized keys file or not. And then uh, we go forward and, and check all the lines in that fi uh, file. And if we find, find a file with correct key type, then we also spend a little time more. And then in the end, we actually get to the uh, bytes of the public key. So that's what I was actually aiming for, because it would be super interesting. Uh, you would have old SSH servers with 768 bits keys. And then you could probably, if you could get them out, you could factor those. But basically, uh, what it, what it go, goes down to, uh, you're not going to actually have that much success there. Uh, so I'll explain that, that later. And <clears throat> but yeah, so let's have for this. This figure is from the user enumeration example. So I have here like uh, made 10 uh, SSH connections. So the genie t uh, allows me to ask for five times, and I always ask for the same key and the same user, and then it closes the connection. And um, I, I have here plotted uh, the timing behavior of these two, two different usernames. So uh, basic, basically, uh, the, green ones, uh, the green one is exists on the machine, and 
the red one doesn't. Um, you could probably all already see from this figure that the, the other is not like, like the other one. So, but um, it's not very reliable. Like if you would be trying to do, uh, try, trying to make, make uh, sense, sense out of this, you would end up, end up with many, um, many, issue, um, many like false positives and so forth. But like usually uh, you don't try to classify each and every sample, you try to classify a group of samples, un unless you have like really, really huge leak, then you could, like in the previous escapologic presentation, there was like a hundred millisecond leak, but this is not so large. So, um, so then we have to kind of go to the filtering and hypothesis testing part. So, um, luckily, there's like a, or luckily, and I don't know, there's like a very simple filter that you can actually use. So it's called sort. And this, this is quite, quite easy in any programming language that I know, usually kind of built in. So uh, you just sort those samples. And then, then you start seeing quite clearly that, hey, these, these other guys, these green guys, they're obviously like way, way ahead of the, uh, uh, the red ones. So probably that's the response which takes longer. And if you really want to see it in detail, uh, you choose kind of low percentage of samples. You could go with the minimum sample. You could go get the fastest response, but that actually is usually quite noisy. For some reasons, I, I don't actually remember right now. But you just choose some low percentage of the samples, and here I'm uh, using my artistic skills to draw boxes uh, over these uh, samples, and then we kind of are able to, there's milliseconds on, uh, on the y-axis, and then we can estimate that we got like a 100 microsecond timing, timing leak here. And that seems to be basically exploitable from, from almost any kind of network with eno enough samples. Uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, this thing here, um, why I'm drawing these uh, nice boxes is that this text, uh, test is called the box test. And basically, you got a classification if these boxes don't overlap. If those overlap, then you either have to rerun the test or then just give up. And uh, <clears throat> if those would be in other, other order, then we got, would have like a false positive or something. But, uh, and what, what's here also meaningful is that if I'm using this normally, I would need to either be able to estimate the uh, software properly so that I know how it behaves, or I need to have like a positive comparison point which I can use to actually uh, know, uh, use to make, make this black box classification. And then I, I can actually um, have like 95% confidence with some values if I, I test that beforehand. And basically, if you're doing this uh, just for, for hypothesis testing, you repeat this test a few thousand times so you can get an estimate how accurate your uh, measurement is. And then you also try to test false positives. If you don't, you can get like two fancy looking results. And so the box test I sold. Uh, it's like a good general filter. You uh, could have like more uh, fancier or nicer situation specific ones. So you could go uh, here in this figure, you could select uh, like the first samples from each five sample set would be also like very, very good uh, predictor, even sometimes better than, than this box test. But uh, it's not very robust, so it changes from system to system, and this is this is like more more stable and and works all the time most of the time. Uh, I tried also using neural networks, which also works, which is basically using a machine to make your situation-specific filter. 
and then it has also this efficiency versus generalization stuff, so you need to get uh, samples from each possible system to actually make classifications to that. So um, now I'm showing what kind of bugs you usually expect to find with these kind of things. So um, I'm categorizing here uh, to branching and comparisons. So branching is usually a large timing leak, and uh, byte comparisons are small timing leaks. And uh, byte comparisons are very hard to measure, but they, they are more dangerous. And for, from branching, you basically get one bit of information. Like in the username enumeration case, you get the information whether the username exists on the server or not. Uh, so this is the earlier OpenSSH branching example. So if out context is not valid, then we just return zero and uh, say that this this doesn't uh, the key is not allowed, and only basically one bit of information there. And then you have this is. I had like two categories, but this is third one. So uh, you have like uh, shared library functions, which you should maybe be careful about. So this is like for in, in the OpenSSH case, this basically tells you what's the key type of the user. And this should also be noticeable over WAN, uh, wider network. And then if you can actually somehow affect the caches of that machine with some other programmer function, then you could ma basically make this leak more visible if you can flush the caches. So before, before this binary, a big number comparison uh, instruction is loaded. So if you are able to flush the cache in the middle, you get like larger timing leak, probably. And then uh, there was this holy grail, which is uh, the comparisons. Uh, this is not exploitable on modern x86 CPUs because uh, the comparison is done per word, uh, on, on individual words. So if you have like comparison between two 64-bit uh, numbers, uh, you need actually to test like two to the power of 63 cases, and you might need like 100,000 samples per case. So we actually end up with a big, pretty big number uh, because this timing leak for comparisons is so small and the uh, brute force space is large. So um, multi-word differences you can notice in practice, at least over kind of local host channels. And then also these kind of things could be exploitable and embedded. So IoT is going to make all the box explo old bugs exploitable again, and so forth. Um, next is an example about uh, tricky networks. So I wanted to know, like, if you have a really bad network, can you actually, so my wide array network connections were so good that I really had no difficulties there whatsoever. So uh, I wanted to have, like, a really, really, really bad uh, network. And I've been doing some Tor hidden service stuff occasionally with Juha. Uh, and then I thought that I, I might try this on hidden service targets. So using the previous 100 microsecond uh, leak, can we actually uh, exploit this in a Tor hidden service target? And actually, um, I don't have the numbers here. And this looks, looks pretty bad. You know, like the delay is uh, changing constantly. It has huge spikes up and down, but uh, it presents basically no challenge. You just need like uh, 1,000 connections, and, and that's it. Uh, because I wanted to do something, I was really disappointed that this worked like right away. So I decided to improve the attack. So I just made some minimum filtering and, and used some uh, edge detection to find these delay bands. And then uh, I was doing all my uh, timing sample classifications within those found delay bands, which gave me like a two times improvement over the naive thing. But um, 
as Tor hidden service connections are slow to make, this is actually dog slow. So with this, you, according to my uh, calculations, you can enumerate like 20 usernames per hour. So this is not really fast. And what I what I want to also say that this is really noisy. So you can detect this from log files. If you look at your log files, you get a huge number of like authentication attempts. Uh, that's pro probable timing attack or somebody just doing something really stupid, other, other stupid kind of thing. So um, next I'm going to give like short overview on countermeasures. It, of, of course, nice to talk about those, those in more detail, but, but let's go. So um, one is, of course, like you write constant time code. So if you, we have the squaring function here, that calculates a scump, uh, no, uh, square of the number. And if uh, instead of returning when, when we actually get to the result, we go through the whole while loop uh, from, from the mini integer minimum to the maximum integer, and then we return the result. But uh, this is sometimes tricky to get right. So for example, in this case, there could be some uh, problems with undefined behavior, because this is defined with using uh, assigned integers, and then uh, also there's also uh, the processor which does its own thing and the compiler which does its own thing. So I, either one of those could could like fuck you up here. Um, so a couple, and and when you have like really complex stuff like the, uh, for example, these syscalls for uh, usernames then you're not going to patch the whole Linux kernel and, and whatnot. So one, one approach that you use, uh, what I found in the literature, is clamping. So you take your number ha pulling hat, and then you pull out a number. And then you, uh, with what you estimate to be like a safe minimum time to return from the, from the function. And you, when you receive a query, you start your timer. And when you're done processing, you stop that timer. And if there is any more left from your guaranteed minimum processing time, you start sleeping. And when you're slept, you return this response. Maybe in some cases, for example, the OpenSSH case, it would be possible to only uh, make the additional delay when the authentication failed, and you wouldn't leak more data. But a, for example, for many crypto functions, you probably would be screwing it up if you would uh, sleep only for fail failed attempts. <clears throat> and then, but um, actually, I wanted to say about this that this uh, sometimes leaks. So uh, why it can leak is that if your number pulling hat isn't functioning correctly and you get too small value for the minimum processing time, uh, you have too many times you go over that or even like very close to that when sleep time is, is not like very, uh, sleep functions are not very linear. So you could end up uh, with, with issues there. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's, that's basically what can happen to you. And the other one is, of course, uh, like uh, what is usually recommend, uh, said as a first response is that uh, you add a random delay. But if it's like completely random, then the network is already doing that. So it's, it's adding jitter there. So uh, you can filter that out with more uh, samples quite easily. But uh, another way is to make the delay constant, uh, not like constant constant, but uh, non-predictable and based on the actual attacker input. So you just take a pseudo random function, you have a key, which you magically pull out of from key hat, and then you sleep according uh, to a non-predictable delay. And then you basically have to do the sleep function for each parameter that you want to protect. And then what happens actually is that the attacker has no comparison point 
so they don't really know whether uh, this uh, timing behavior was caused by their uh, choice of input or whether it was actually your processing time which was different. Uh, what, how this leaks is basically the deviation of the delay will be different for either one of those cases. So, but if you combine it with the last, uh, so last uh, countermeasure, you pre are pretty much in the safe waters. And the last uh, countermeasure is probably better than this one anyway, because it doesn't require any keys or anything like that. Uh, so that's all, folks. Uh, you can email me if you want to chat or, or something, and you can find me also on IRCnet. Thank you. So, do we have any questions, comments? All right. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have one question regarding: Have you found any vulnerabilities in the wild with your method? Oh uh, well. Uh, so this uh, open SSH. Uh, uh, any product? Have you you know? So so like um, if. Uh, I reported this to OpenSSS like a year ago. Okay. Uh, and fix is probably on the way. I don't know. They, this is not like a high security vulnerability because it doesn't really allow you to get any keys or anything like that. But you can probably enumerate users, which is bad for some people. Okay. But, uh, and of course, so, and uh, as I said earlier, it's, uh, I don't know, like how, at least I don't know how much these are exploited in the wild, but but people tend to fix these if they find them. Find them. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. So no further questions. Uh, have a nice evening and enjoy the event. Thank you.